Number 12 of A Christmas Miscellany 2018 by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Number 12. The First Christmas Surprise, The Directory Santa Claus by Patton Beard. When Dotty had made the surprise book upon that memorable day when she had not been able to go to school, she had calculated wrongly. So Marjorie's surprise book had more than the usual number of leaves, and it lasted till the following Christmas. The first surprise of that December, which closed Marjorie's surprise book, seemed very thick and fat indeed. It proved to be two stories in place of one, and with them was a Christmas card i'm sorry that the surprise book must end sighed marjorie aren't you dot and of course dotty held out hopes that santa claus might bring another i shouldn't wonder if he did for santa claus likes to make surprises maybe it was he himself who had told mother how to make the first surprise book long ago they each chose one of the surprise book's christmas surprise stories for mother to read aloud on christmas afternoon when the stories were opened dotty's came first it was the directory santa claus christmas holidays had begun and school was out the scholars had spoken christmas pieces that told of gift giving and santa claus rose schneider and lily pfeiffer with school books under their arms pushed open the heavy oak doors of the big city library and trotted with one accord upstairs to join the line of children waiting to get in i got a dandy book lily volunteered as they wedged into the waiting line it was all about a little girl that went to see santa claus i'm bringing it back now say rose you get it on your card it's an awfully nice story but rose shook her head the thin snub of her nose turned up even higher than ever it added emphasis to her refusal there ain't any santa claus she said i never had any christmas presents from him well lily insisted i ain't either but i think there is a santa claus all right he don't know us maybe but he's awfully good to some children my cousin that goes to sunday school gets a doll and a box of candy and an orange from him every christmas he has a long white beard and he's ever so jolly salvation armies they make santa clauses they're not real only anybody dressed up most likely your cousin santa claus was like that rose retorted the salvation army santa clauses they always stand by the street corners to catch christmas dinner pennies in their pails no twasn't that kind of santa claus he's real well you won't find him in no directory rose argued you just go and look and real folks names is in it and you won't find santa claus there ain't any with this parting thrust rose squeezed through a sudden opening in the line and escaped into the reading room beyond lily waited for her book to be discharged then she raised a questioning little hand toward the lady at the library desk please she asked where is the directory book downstairs the librarian answered and downstairs lily went the directory book was really very very big indeed it was almost a pity that it couldn't be a story book for one could never have done with a story book that size and there'd always be something new to read in it when the fat volume was opened on its desk lily studied it at random trying to make out what it all meant she decided to begin at the very beginning so she commenced with a turned on to b and ran her forefinger down page after page it took a great deal of time and patience. The text was very small, and Lily was afraid she might overlook it. Down page after page it traveled, till it came to Claus. Oh, there it was. Claus, Edolf, Carpenter. No, that couldn't be Santa Claus. The whole name wasn't right, and besides that, he wasn't a carpenter, Lily felt sure. How many people there were by the name of Claus? well with patience one might find the right one then i shall tell rose that there is a santa claus for sure thought lily on down the list she went there was an s t claus that was the nearest to it who knows what that s t might mean in a way of abbreviation the address was not far from the library lily decided to go down the avenue and find out if it were where the real santa claus lived 
the long winter twilight was beginning when lily came out of the library already the lights from the grocery and the drug store on the corner beyond warmed the grey cold stone of the pavement with red light further over past the intersecting street an arc lamp made a misty star in the dimness toward the star of light lily made her way yes yes she was on the right side of the street she was getting nearer nearer lily's heart went pit-a-pat oh there it was there it was it was a little shop that bore the number over its window was a sign s t claus somewhere lily thought she had seen santa claus's name written that way it was the very place no doubt in the shop window was a wee green tinsel covered tree toys were caught in the branches they overflowed on to the broad base of the display window cats dogs carts steam engines dolls baby carriages jumping jacks oh lily stood staring transfixed with wonder for for there in the store visible through the lighted window was a small jolly-looking white-bearded man exactly like the picture of santa claus in the story-book to be sure his white beard was not quite so long and he wore a grey knit coat instead of a bright red one with white fur on it but his occupation of stringing christmas tree chains was so very santa claus like there could be no mistake in identity just here he came to the window and added a box of gay candles to the display of toys he looked out at lily through the frosty panes and smiled hello he called by way of cheery greeting hello returned lily and somehow before she knew it she was standing in the shop beside the worn counter looking up into the merry face of mr claus it was through the directory that i found you she smiled rose snyder she says there ain't no real santa claus but i says there is for sure a lot of children must have passed here and not known where santa claus lived maybe but i found you santa claus doubled in a hearty chuckle and here i am all the time he laughed just every day didn't anybody know you was the real santa claus lily gazed confidently into the old man's bright eyes they had ought to know by the sign she suggested how should they the little man replied santa claus everybody knows he likes to be an ordinary citizen you won't tell the kids will you lily hesitated no not if you don't want i should but there is rose snyder and she says there ain't any real santa claus it was through her saying that i found you in the directory she said there wasn't no such name there there was a silence i've got it he announced suddenly just why don't rose believe in santa claus because he never brought her any presents or what i think it's because you forgot her mostly returned lily i says to her you forgot me too but you didn't know about us maybe he thought where do you two kids live he questioned and she told him i'll tell you what i'll do said he i don't want the other children to find it out that i am the real santa claus so you better not tell them you run home now and you keep it quiet wait till real santa claus time at christmas then rose will believe ah yes and she did it was a wonderful wonderful christmas for lily and rose it was better even than rose's cousin's christmas for they shared together a little tree that was left on christmas eve from santa claus and each little girl had a doll and some candy and a game it's from the real santa claus and i know him but you don't rosie snyder lily beamed and rose retorted i do too believe in the real santa claus i want a story about the real santa claus and the little girl she demanded of the librarian at the children's reading room next day lily pfeiffer she says it's an awfully good story and she likes i should know more about him it's true for sure ain't it and the librarian smiled End of The First December Surprise, The Directory Santa Claus by Patton Beard Number 13 of A Christmas Miscellany 2018 by Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Number 13, The Second December Surprise, Mary Elizabeth's Soldierly Christmas marjorie's christmas story was called mary elizabeth's soldierly christmas 
she said she liked it better than the story dotty chose from the surprise book's christmas pocket you can tell what you think about it for yourself for here it is mary elizabeth looked up from the soldier's scarf she was learning to knit her mother in the rocker beside mary elizabeth's hassock caught a bit of anxious thought that rested between mary elizabeth's brown eyes what is it she asked putting her hand down upon mary elizabeth's to stop the knitting needles i was thinking mary elizabeth sighed just thinking mother it's going to be a very soldierly christmas this year isn't it but the children they don't realize it and they're thinking and talking about santa claus are we going to have the tree this year mary elizabeth's mother patted mary elizabeth's hand softly we've always had one haven't we daughter she said can you remember the time when we did not have one no laughed mary elizabeth i suppose it was when i was too small a baby ever to have a tree or so little that i didn't know what the lights were and thought i would like to play with their sparkles but i do remember the tree we had when i was a little bit older it was before any of the children came i was about three years old i think you told me that the tree was made in honor of the little christ child's birthday and i always thought you meant a little child like myself and expected to see him mary elizabeth paused then i grew bigger and by and by there were all the children and the baby and i was the oldest and we all thought that a funny friend who was a jolly old man called santa claus brought us the toys we found in our stockings we thought all the play was real about his coming down the chimney and about his sleigh with the eight reindeer it used to seem strange that so big a man as santa claus could squeeze down our chimney and by and by i suspected it was all a play and you told me that it was just a funny jolly way to make the very little children enjoy the fun of christmas surprises you told me then that i might help toward christmas myself by trimming the tree that was to be my part each year i was to do it all myself and every year i tried to make it some new and lovely kind of a surprise i always have loved to fix the tree i always have felt that it must be the kind of tree that the little christ child would love if he came in the way that i used to think you meant when i was still little your tree has always been a beautiful tree mary elizabeth mother smiled it has always been a tree that shone with happiness each year we have loved it so that the children could not bear to part with it at new year's you know mary elizabeth smiled but her question still remained unanswered will there be a tree this year she asked i'm afraid the children would be sad without it mother i too have been thinking mary elizabeth said mother it is indeed a soldierly christmas what do you think we had better do well answered mary elizabeth thoughtfully we have the ornaments though i usually buy some new ones i would have to get candles the tree would not cost so very much only it seems as if every penny ought to go to the little french and belgian children and there are the soldiers to send things to and when everything is the way it is why it really hardly seems like christmas i know returned mother but we sent all the money in the children's bank and all your money and my money mary elizabeth we have the soldiers things all done almost i think we ought to have the tree for the children and you can fix it up somehow can't you yes smiled mary elizabeth but she was thinking that she must somehow find a way to make that tree as pretty as usual even without any money to buy things that day and the next mary elizabeth pondered the question she thought of this and of that but nothing seemed quite right there was no way to earn any money and the tree had no star for the top it had been lost somehow it was not with the tree fixings in the box in the attic how to get a new star that was one question how to get the candles was another and mary elizabeth's tree had always been a tree that people came in to look at and admire it was not like any other tree it was always a surprise somehow money was needed to buy things to make it wonderful money was needed to make it a bright surprise as usual at school mary elizabeth found herself puzzling over this problem as vacation time drew near it was harder for her than any arithmetic problem for it could not be solved at all twice she saved five cents by walking home and that bought candles but the problem remained as usual it was how to get more money then there came the day when the magazine came 
it was always something of an event when the magazine came it had new pictures in it and often it had cut out pages for the little children once there had been a circus with clowns to cut out and ever since that time brother somehow got a hold of the paper as soon as mother took it from its wrapper he was always hoping for more circus you know he knew its pages by heart and spelled out the titles and headings of the pictures when mary elizabeth came home one day he announced that the magazine had come what's in it questioned mary elizabeth pictures brother replied mysteriously but not any of a circus it's a puzzle page you have to guess what the pictures are and they'll give a prize of five dollars to the one who answers and tells what the pictures are but brother was still busy with the magazine and mary elizabeth was called away to help mother with the little sister she did not see the page though she thought about it and wondered if she could answer all the questions and get the money that way to trim the christmas tree in the evening after supper after the little children had gone off to bed and brother too with them she found the magazine and looked it over yes it was a contest and the pictures were mother goose it seemed easy to guess them mary elizabeth guessed simple simon right away it was the picture of a funny doll fishing in a little pail with a hook and line she tried the others she was not so sure of all but she guessed them with the help of the little children's mother goose to refresh her memory she was so excited that she felt the prize was already hers she was sure she must win just think of it the first prize was five whole dollars and the second prize was two whole dollars and there were eight other prizes each of one whole big dollar ten chances that mary elizabeth might earn some money for her christmas tree her hands shook as she took up pen and put it to paper she used her very best paper and three times or more she discarded what she had written and tried to do better she wrote with extreme pains and slowly it took all the evening just to write the short answer she put it into its envelope to mail on the way to school next day but she said nothing about it as she kissed mother good night nearer and nearer came christmas time the little children talked more than ever about santa claus brother planned what kind of a stocking he would hang up they talked about the tree and asked mary elizabeth what she supposed santa claus would make as a tree surprise this year at these times laughingly mary elizabeth suggested that there would be candles on the tree and that perhaps there would be tinsel she said that maybe santa claus would send all his christmas to the little french and belgian children and not have much to make into a surprise here at home she told them stories about santa claus and the santa claus land she played with them to keep them amused but she thought all the time of the mother goose contest and as time went on she felt less sure each day of having won once she passed by the ten cent store and found a beautiful gold star and wanted to buy it then one day mary elizabeth actually found a ten cent piece near a shop upon a busy sidewalk in town her heart went thump at the sight of it she asked several persons if they had lost anything and they replied no so mary elizabeth went straight to the ten cent store and bought a star right away all this time mary elizabeth watched anxiously for the postman the time set for the close of the contest came and passed no letter was brought to mary elizabeth she knew that she would have had a letter if she had won any prize of course but mary elizabeth with her heart heavy as lead wondered whether she had really ever believed she would win she admitted that she had she was sure her work was right that is all answers were correct the writing was neat there were no blots she had done her very best mary elizabeth was too soldierly to cry she told nobody she set about planning how she would cut paper ornaments out of colored wall papers and paste them together she would make some paper dolls and dress them like fairies with the tissue paper she had she would make wings with tissue paper too she would ask mother to let her make some gingerbread animals and men to use on the tree she would gild some nuts and pine cones maybe there was the star there was the box of candles those were something but if only she did have money she would trim her tree with the emblems of all the allies and have a really soldierly christmas tree mary elizabeth went into her room and locked her door tight 
she took the key of her lower bureau drawer and sat down upon the floor beside it and drew it out in it lay all the christmas tree things with the box of candles and the star as she looked at the bright christmas things a tear dropped upon her lap oh it might have been so different why is it that when one is just in the midst of christmas planning somebody comes to the door and knocks did you ever spread all your things out on a bed or table or on the floor and fail to have somebody come to knock at your door and demand to be let in right away there came a knock at mary elizabeth's but first the latch had been tried let me in mary elizabeth cried brother i can't returned mary elizabeth you can thumpity thump 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 go away admonished mary elizabeth i shan't let you in you can't come in well you'll be sorry said the muffled voice of brother you'll be sorry but he left off knocking at the door and ran away mary elizabeth wondered if perhaps he suspected about the play of santa claus he was getting to be quite big maybe he knew about the tree maybe he would have to be let into the fun of christmas planning next year but was it fun wasn't it dreadful to worry about the tree and plan how to make it all new no it was not worry no it was not mary elizabeth denied this stoutly it was part of the self-sacrifice of christmas to think about it as she had and there would be a lovely tree yes there would somehow she had managed to make a grand surprise of it oh yes she would mary elizabeth smiled and was ashamed of that little hot tear she put the christmas tree things back into the drawer one by one and she closed and locked the drawer then she went to the window and looked out across the snow she thought maybe some cotton would look pretty and snowy on the tree like that she heard brother at the door again but she wasn't quite ready to let him in she wanted to be alone and think she did not want to tell stories about santa claus his little voice came plaintively please mary elizabeth let me in i'll tell you something nice if you'll let me in but mary elizabeth was not ready to hear what brother thought santa claus was going to bring she did not go to the door then she heard his soft little footsteps trot away down the hall and she felt sorry she opened the door to run after him and there where brother had left it there lay a big square envelope with the name of the magazine upon it mary elizabeth gasped she tore it open and read dear mary elizabeth your good work has merited the reward of the second prize of two dollars offered in the mother goose contest the money is enclosed and we hope that it will bring with it a very happy christmas happy christmas hooray oh how fine happy christmas why of course happy christmas wasn't it splendid wasn't it a surprise waving the letter she hugged everybody that she met mother brother and all the children something splendid had happened they all agreed everybody congratulated mary elizabeth but only mother really guessed why mary elizabeth didn't spend it all right then and there the very first day in buying candy and peanuts that was what brother and the little children suggested but next day after vacation had really begun and when the little children and brother were safely out of the way mary elizabeth with her little red kid purse slipped out of the house and off to buy the flags of the allies to use for the christmas tree mary elizabeth had decided too what the christmas surprise was to be yes it would be a tree covered with flags and old glory would be with the star at the top and then came tree trimming and the tree was oh oh it was ever so much more wonderful than any tree had ever been before everybody said so the little children said so brother said so mary elizabeth herself knew it was so all the poor little children who came to the tree said so it was mother however who knew about the very soldierly santa claus that had made the tree so lovely it honored the little christ child's birthday dear she said as she kissed mary elizabeth good night it is the tree of the soldiers who are fighting for all that christmas means the star was there replied mary elizabeth end of the second december surprise mary elizabeth's soldierly christmas
number fourteen of a christmas miscellany twenty eighteen by various this librivox recording is in the public domain number fourteen christmas eve by vera c barclay it was to be a particularly jolly christmas in danny's home this year for his soldier uncle was coming to be there and two or three little cousins his mother had made some big plum puddings the house was decorated with holly and mistletoe and to put the final touch of perfection it was snowing and the boys would be able to make a snowman on christmas afternoon danny was very happy all seemed perfect but on the morning of christmas eve a letter came by post that altered things the letter was from danny's uncle bill it was a sad letter it told how bill and his wife who had looked forward to a happy christmas would have a dull and sad one their son expected home from germany could not get leave they had both been so ill with influenza that bill had not been able to work and was therefore terribly hard up and his wife had been unable to go out and buy anything to make christmas jolly bill was a woodcutter and lived in a little tiny old cottage on the edge of a wood about five miles from danny's home as danny listened to his mother reading the letter aloud a thought came into his mind at first he tried to send it away and not to see it but a voice within him said you're a cub and when good ideas come to you you ought not to tell them to go away it is giving in to yourself if you are selfish you will not enjoy your christmas so danny let the thought come back and presently he told it to his mother mother he said will you pack up some nice things in a basket then i will start off after breakfast and walk over to poor uncle bill's and i'll decorate up all their house with holly and go and do shopping for aunt bridget and then i'll spend christmas with them and try and cheer them up and make them forget they're disappointed cause ted hasn't come home danny's mother was surprised you're a good boy to think of it she said but have you forgotten the cubs party on christmas evening no said danny i haven't forgotten it he stuck his hands in his pockets and whistled to pretend he didn't mind at all about missing the christmas party where all his fellow cubs would be enjoying themselves i'll be sorry to miss uncle jim he said tell him so mother won't you and keep me a bit of plum pudding but i must go and cheer up poor uncle bill and so half an hour later he started off to tramp the long five miles a kit bag full of good things slung over his shoulder the snowflakes fell soft and white and the feeling of christmas was in the air and danny was very happy far happier than he expected to be this christmas as he tramped along the snowy roads he was thinking of the strange story of uncle bill and the bad luck that had seemed to follow him Bill's father had been a man who owned a good deal of property, and a very clever man, too, able to earn much money. But from boyhood he had been a miser. His one thought had been to earn gold, and then store it away in secret, and count it up and gloat over it, but never spend more than he possibly could help, and never, never give any away. And so he brought up his children in rags, and often they had to go hungry and barefoot he sold his property to get more gold and lived in a miserable little house by a wood at last his three boys tired of this wretched life ran away from home and went to sea two of them were drowned and bill found himself the only remaining member of his family with the exception of his sister danny's mother who had married and left home when bill was twenty-one he received a message that his father was dead and that all the gold he had amassed during his life would now belong to his son so feeling he was a very rich man he married a nice girl from the little irish seaport where he was staying and returned home as quickly as possible but when he reached his native village he learnt the bad news that the miser had died without leaving any will and had hidden his gold so well that no one could find it all that poor bill inherited was a little old cottage and a woodcutter's axe there was nothing for it but to make the best of a bad job and settle down in the little house and become a woodcutter and so bill and his young wife did their best to make a comfortable home of the old place but it was a hard life and it was difficult always to be contented when they knew that somewhere thousands of golden sovereigns lay hidden that should have belonged to them 
one son was born to them and now he was nineteen and had been fighting in france for the past year it had been a long tramp but at last danny found himself in the wood on the borders of which was uncle bill's cottage there was plenty of lovely holly covered with berries in this wood and up in an oak tree danny saw some mistletoe so putting down his bundle and taking out his knife he climbed the tree and cut down a great bunch of it and then filled his arms with holly he looked like the very spirit of christmas as he stood in the doorway of uncle bill's house the snow thick on him his red muffler making a bright patch of colour his arms full of holly and mistletoe and a great bulging kit bag slung across his back the little room of the cottage looked dull and dismal only a tiny fire burned feebly in the great open fireplace bill and his wife looking pale and ill sat one each side in silence but danny's appearance seemed to work a miracle he had brought the spirit of youth to the house before long they were all laughing he and uncle bill were putting up holly above the pictures and hanging the mistletoe in the chimney corner and bridget was unpacking the kit bag before long danny had been out and chopped some logs so that a fire was roaring and crackling up the chimney and sending sparks flying like fire fairies this is something like christmas said uncle bill as they sat down to a good dinner from what danny had brought though the plum pudding and mince pies were being kept for christmas day after dinner danny started off for the village to buy the things aunt bridget needed by the time he had finished his shopping and was starting back again for the woodcutters the sun had set in a glory of red beyond the snowy trees and blue dusk was quickly closing in as danny passed the last house in the village he was surprised to see a figure standing in the garden he had noticed this house before as he passed and had seen that it stood empty the windows shuttered the doors locked and everything deserted coming nearer he looked curiously at the figure it was that of a very very old man thin and bent with a long white beard and long white hair he was shaking his head and talking to himself in a most sorrowful voice a sorry thing a sorry thing he was saying to be gone eighty years old and never a corner to lay your head on christmas eve danny stopped filled with pity for the aged man hello granddaddy said is there anything i can do for you the old man shook his head mournfully nay nay he said i be eighty years old and i've walked nine mile to spend christmas with my grandson and now i come to his house and find it empty i haven't got nowhere to lay my head this night and not a penny to pay for a lodging it's dying a cold i'll be a lying in a ditch all night and he took out a big red handkerchief from his pocket and began to wipe his eyes it was too sad to think of this somehow a happy christmas must be provided for this old man so pathetically like father christmas himself danny knew the charitable spirit that uncle bill always showed and the warm generous heart of his irish aunt and so he felt sure they would welcome this poor old stranger come home with me grandad he said you'll find a roaring log fire and an armchair in the chimney corner and tomorrow you shall eat christmas pudding the old man looked almost dazed with surprise. He peered closer at Danny. Is it a Christmas fairy you are out of the wood? He said in a whisper. This was splendid to be taken for a fairy. Yes, said Danny laughing and taking the aged man's cold, gnarled old hand. He led him through the wood to his uncle's house. Sure, cried his aunt as she opened the door. I do believe he's off to bring on us Father Christmas himself danny soon explained and bill and bridget gave the old stranger a warm welcome they do say exclaimed bridget that if you welcome a stranger on christmas eve he may be an angel tain't no angel as i be said the old man shaking his head and then he laughed and he had little twinkling eyes if there be an angel about tis yourself or the boy here every one was hungry that night and supper was a cheery meal but after supper came the time danny longed for the lamp was put out to save the oil and the bright dancing firelight glowed in the quaint little room with its crooked beams and uneven floor 
in the deep chimney corner one on each side sat bill and bridget and enthroned in the large armchair before the fire sat the ancient stranger puffing contentedly at a long clay pipe danny was curled up on the rabbit-skin rug now he said his eyes dancing with expectation now for stories so to the accompaniment of crackles from the logs bill recounted many a strange and thrilling yarn of his sailor's days at last he was silent grandad said danny turning to the ancient stranger will you tell us a story a mysterious one i'm sure there were fairies and hobgoblins when you were a boy long long ago or do you know a ghost story the old man nodded his head yes he said there were fairies sure enough when i was a boy but i was not a good enough boy to see them but a hobgoblin i did see once twas on such a night as this christmas eve with snow on the ground and twas but a stone's throw from this very house this was splendid danny turned round and fixed his eyes on the old man's face tell us tell us he whispered i was born in this here village he said and here i married a lass and here my son was born and was on his first christmas he fell ill of the croup very near death he was and my wife begged me to run fast as i could to fetch the doctor the shortest way was through this here wood and though i was afeard something terrible of the little people as might come after me in the dark still for love of the boy i came this way twas moonlight and as i reached the end of the wood just about outside of this house i breathed again with relief but too soon for when i got to the druid's oak you know it for sure that big old oak the last of the wood i saw a hobgoblin the old man made an impressive pause danny was gazing at him round-eyed what was it like he said twas dressed all in a black cloak with a hood over its head and it had a great bag on its back it was up in the druid's oak and just before i got to it it dropped to the ground light as a feather and ran quickly into the shadows i was half mad with fear and calling on the saints to protect me i ran and never stopped till i reached the doctor's house that story is true by all that's holy i swear tis true how big was the hobgoblin asked danny near as big as you said the old man i thought they was smaller so it frightened me the more i told the story to one and another in the village and some laughed at me but one or two very solemn like told me they had seen that hobgoblin too they said that twas very lucky to see it but one must not talk of it to any man one man told me that the next day he went by daylight past the same tree and in the snow found a gold piece which was just what he was sorely needing he was sure twas the hobgoblin had put it there for him and sure enough my baby was cured from croup from that time do you think the hobgoblin still lives in the oak asked danny as still comes out on christmas eve oh yes said the ancient stranger hobgoblins live for five hundred years this one is still in the oak as likely as not and they used to say he always comes out on christmas eve oh cried danny i wish i could see him perhaps he would bring luck to uncle bill the great log fire was beginning to burn low the ancient stranger was beginning to nod the church clock struck ten through the stillness of the clear night while the earth slept beneath its counterpane of snow time to turn in said bill he took the aged stranger and led him to the little room that would have been Danny's, but which Danny had insisted should be given to the stranger, saying he could sleep very well on the rabbit-skin rug before the fire. "'I think I shall go and look for the hobgoblin,' said Danny. "'Tis foolishness you are talking, child,' said Bridget. "'There do be no hobgoblins in this country. If you must be after getting good luck for me and your uncle, go to midnight mass and pray for us.' tis more likely you will get what you do be wantin there than from hobgoblins but when all was still and the stranger was snoring and the line of yellow light under bill and bridget's door had vanished danny got softly up from the skin before the fire and put on his cap and coat and muffler took down a lantern from the wall and put a box of matches in his pocket then he unbarred the door and let himself out into the snowy night a few minutes later he was standing in the shadows gazing with awe and expectation at the druid's oak where it stood gnarled and ancient in the moonlight 
for some time he stood there watching but it was very cold and he grew impatient walking with silent steps over the snow he went up to the tree and laid his hand on the rough knobbly trunk the night was perfectly still the moon shone steady and white and at that moment the church clock struck eleven slowly and clearly danny shuddered this was the hour for ghosts and hobgoblins to prowl the next hour twelve to one o'clock would be the holy hour when we remember the birth of the divine babe the last stroke of eleven had scarcely died away when there was a scraping scrambling sound from the very heart of the oak seemingly coming from beneath danny's hand he started and his heart seemed to miss a beat and then race on something within him seemed to say run run and his legs almost obeyed but his will was stronger than his instinct and remembering that he was a cub and must not give in to himself he stood his ground only drawing a little into the shadow he watched the tree intently was he at last to see a hobgoblin something black moved in the stumpy branches at the top of the thick low trunk then with a hoot a great owl floated out on soft silent wings and flew swiftly away into the shadows danny breathed hard for a while he did not move then giving away once more to his impatience he went up to the tree it was curious that the scraping sound should have seemed to come from the very heart of the trunk it must be a hollow tree he told himself then that was where the hobgoblin lived Perhaps he had changed himself into an owl and flown away on his midnight adventures. An idea suddenly struck Danny. He would climb the tree and see if it was possible to get down into its hollow inside. He would then find the home of the hobgoblin and perhaps the mysterious door into fairyland. He lit his lantern and hooked it on a branch, then climbed up by the knots which seemed to form little steps. Yes, yeah, sure enough, the tree was hollow there was a hole down into its inside just big enough for a boy to squeeze through danny tied a piece of string to his lantern and let it down through the hole carefully he lowered it until at last it rested on the ground then he peered down to his amazement he found that a little ladder led down the inside of the tree without a moment's hesitation he descended the ladder the tree was like a tiny round room inside and in the floor at his feet was a hole with a little narrow staircase leading down danny pinched himself was he dreaming no he was certainly awake could this really be the way into fairyland he had only half believed in the hobgoblin all the time but now he began to think it must really all be true taking up his lantern he carefully descended the steps one by one there were ten of them and found himself in a little kind of grotto the walls were of earth and full of gnarled tree roots the grotto was empty except for a rough wooden chest that looked as if it had been made by someone who was not a very good carpenter with trembling hands danny raised the lid and looked in a number of large leather bags were ranged side by side at the bottom and among them was a stout leather book breathing hard danny lifted out one of the bags it was very heavy he placed it on the floor and it chinked then he untied the string and put his hand in it was a fistful of glittering coins that he drew forth suddenly it all flashed into his mind the miser and his hidden money this must have been his hiding place where the hobgoblin came in he did not know or care all that mattered was that he had found the hidden treasure that belonged to uncle bill and would make him a rich man one by one danny lifted out the leather bags there must be thousands of pounds there he told himself the sovereigns were funny-looking ones with the head of queen victoria when quite young on them last of all he took out the fat leather book then very carefully he managed to hoist one bag after another up the tree and dump it down on the snow at last he climbed down himself very softly he carried his treasure into the cottage looking for somewhere to put the bags an idea struck him and he hung them in a row on the nails in the high mantel-shelf over the great open hearth how pleased uncle bill would be what a wonderful christmas surprise 
and with that thought it struck Danny how good it was of God to have let him find the missing money for his uncle. He glanced at the clock. A quarter to twelve, it said. Aunt Bridget has said he should go to midnight mass and pray for their luck to come back. Now he would do better than that. He could go and thank God for having given it back. Putting on his cap once more, he hurried out along the snowy path and turned into the warm, lighted church. Never had he thanked God so fervently for anything. But soon he forgot all about the money in the wonderful sense of Christmas morning and the new realization of the little Christ born to be the brother and savior of men. Very sleepily he stumbled home and curled up on the rug before the red glow of smoldering logs. "'How soundly he sleeps,' said Uncle Bill the next morning as he lighted the lamp and bent over Danny. Bridget laughed and shook him by the shoulders. Danny opened his eyes and sat up. His first thought was to look up at the mantelpiece. Yes, there hung the bags. Oh, thank God, he said. I was afraid it was a dream. Bill and Bridget looked up, too. What are they? said Bill, a puzzled expression on his face. Plum puddings? Danny laughed. No, no, he said. Ugh. He unhooked a bag and shook out the shining contents onto the rabbit skin rug. The sovereigns gleamed and glinted in the lamplight bill and bridget stood speechless then danny explained all that had happened at last they examined the book it was inscribed at the beginning with the miser's name in a little crabbed handwriting and there were entries made every christmas eve beginning with christmas eighteen thirty each christmas there was a larger sum to record until at last in eighteen ninety eight was entered three thousand one hundred pounds and it's all yours uncle said danny smacking bill on the back bill's heart was too full to speak at first but bridget had plenty to say all that they would do with it all that this would mean for the boy's future and their old age the stranger joined them at breakfast didn't i tell you he was father christmas or a holy angel said bridget see what he has brought us nay tis the lad said the ancient stranger i said he was a fairy or maybe twas a hobgoblin he always brings luck and the owl who flew out of the tree was him as likely as not bill was a pious man not given to belief in such things no he said twas the holy child bringing us a christmas gift for love of the boy here who was willing to give up his happy christmas at home to come and cheer up his poor old uncle and to give his bed to an old lonely stranger added the old man Danny flushed. No, 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 he said. It wasn't for my sake. But I do think Uncle is right about it being a Christmas present. I went to midnight mass to thank for it. Aunt Bridget kissed him for the twentieth time, and Bill cleared his throat, which seemed rather husky. But what about the hobgoblin, really? said Danny. Grandad here swears he saw him, and you see it was true about the druid's oak being a wonderful tree. Bill went to a big press in the corner of the room i think i know who the hobgoblin was come here son he added danny went to him and behind the door of the cupboard uncle bill arrayed him in an old black cloak and hood now hang a bag over your shoulder and hurry across the room bent up like and see if your granddad don't think he's seeing his hobgoblin again he said danny obeyed and the old man started up tis him tis him he said the very same they all laughed my father said bill was a very small thin little old man not much bigger than danny twas him you saw fetching back his money on christmas eve to count it and enter it in his book the old man was nodding his head slowly so after all i've never seen a hobgoblin he said i'm eighty year old i shall die afore i get another chance never mind grandad said bridget you'll be after seeing the angels then so it'll be all right end of christmas eve by vera c barclay number fifteen of a christmas miscellany twenty eighteen by various this librivox recording is in the public domain number fifteen santa claus by eden philpotts nobody knew where teddy pegram came from or why the man ordained to settle down in little silver 
he had no relations round about and couldn't or wouldn't tell his new neighbours what had brought him along but he bided a bit with mrs ford the policeman's wife as a lodger and then when he'd sized up the place and found it suited him he took a tumble-down four-room cottage at the back side of the village and worked upon it himself and soon had the place to his liking a most handy little man he was and could turn his skill in many directions and he'd do odd jobs for the neighbors and show a good bit of kindness to the children he lived alone and looked after himself for he could cook and sew like a woman at least like the clever ones in fact there didn't seem to be nothing he couldn't do and his knowledge extended above crafts for he'd got a bit of learnin also and he'd talk with johns at the shop of all sorts about business or with samuel mutters the chemist about patent medicines or with butcher or baker concerning their jobs or with policemen about crime and be worth attending to on any subject his pleasure however was sporting and not until he dwelt among us a good bit did a measure of doubt in that manner creep into our praise of the man round about fifty he might have been a clean-shaved active chap five feet three inches high and always bursting with energy he had grizzled hair and a blue chin and eyes so bright and black as shoe buttons a hard mouth and lips always pursed up over his yellow teeth but though it looked a cruel sort of mouth not cruel ever came out of it save in the matter of politics he was a red radical and didn't go to church yet against that you could set his all-round good will and friendship and his uncommon knack of lending a hand to anybody in his power to serve but he was up against the government and would talk so fierce of a night sometimes at the barley sheaf that ned chown the landlord who was a true blue didn't think so well on mr pegram as most of us friends he made but hadn't much use for the women though he declared himself as not against them he was a bachelor-minded man by nature and yet what ain't so common in that sort he liked childer and often had a halfpenny in his pocket for one of his pets mrs ford however he regarded as a great and trustworthy friend and her husband also for from the time he lodged with them they all agreed uncommon well and joseph ford the policeman was high in his praises of teddy from the first he happened to be a very radical thinker himself did joseph but as became his calling put law and order first and you felt that the newcomer agreed on that matter and didn't want to do anything contrary to the constitution but just advance the welfare of the underdog by proper means so joseph said there was no fault in the man and praised his opinions in truth teddy pegram appeared to be a very great stickler for the law and held it in high respect so he always declared and reckoned that those who put themselves within the reach of it deserved all they got he might say doubtful things to joseph ford's ear now and again but not the policeman could fairly quarrel with because both joseph and minnie his wife owed teddy a bit by now and doting on their little son as they did felt a bit weak to the man in that quarter their only child was six years old and the amazing beauty of young joey ford made him many friends beside mr pegram he was one of their children that looked too good and too beautiful for this world and you feel that by rights they did ought to grow a pair of wings and fly away to heaven and for that matter old jane marks who was famous for seeing and pointing out the dark side of all human hopes warned minnie more than once against putting her whole trust in the beautiful boy to my eye there's early death looking out of his eyes jane marks would say such blue eyes belong to the sky minnie and there's more to it than his angel face because the child's so parlous good that it ain't strainin truth to say the old adam be left out of him and granted that this veil of tears is no place for such a boy heaven's his home mrs marks would say and so you must fortify yourself for an early loss minnie didn't worry however because her son was a strong lad and sturdy as well as lovely he'd gotten his father's fine shape and his mother's gentle heart and though good as gold he weren't a merry boy as we say one of them gentle frightened childer who can't let go their mother's apron that sort if they grow up turn into indoor manservants and ain't very powerful as a rule in their bodies or intellects 
but joey was a brave young lad enough and had already fixed on his father's profession for his own and teddy pegram took most powerful to him and made him many a game and many a clever toy he'd walk with the child to the woods sometimes and teach him the ways of birds and beasts and show him how to catch em for ted was a rare sportsman and deeply skilled in all the branches of it and twas his bent in that direction led to the extraordinary affair of this tale though it was a good year before the crash came and for a long time no cloud arose to darken his steadfast friendship with the fords you might say they was more than friends for teddy explained to the young couple that he stood alone in the world without chick or child of his own and felt very wishful to have some special interest in his fellow creatures i followed the sea he told them once and that's why i'm so handy all around but my passion be sportin and now havin earned a little competence i've retired from the ocean and don't want to hear nor yet see it no more and you folks suit me and i suit you so i'll put you first and if all goes well in the time to come i dare say your lad if not yourselves will be the gainers they was very pleased of course and many showed it by fussing over the man a bit and looking after his linen now and then and doing such chores for him as he'd let her do but he was very independent and finding he weren't over anxious for her and her husband to be in his house though always very willing to come to hers she gave over her attempts to befriend him in that direction little joey however was always welcome and he'd often drop in on the old sailor and never in vain teddy was fond of sporting dogs and he'd got a lurcher bitch from somewhere and when she bore a litter six weeks before christmas he had the thought to give joey the best of the bunch when they was a fortnight old he drowned all but one and on christmas eve after the child was to bed and asleep he took the little dog over and stopped and had a drink and explained his purpose twas strange to them to hear the hard-faced grim-looking chap talk so tender of their only one but they liked it well enough and fell in with his wish he promised to eat his christmas dinner along with them and joey but the pup was to come as a rare surprise next morning and though many ford didn't much hold with a young dog about her spick and span home she couldn't withstand the little silky creature nor yet teddy's wish to pleasure the child you do this minnie he said for he called the family by their christian names by now you keep the dog till dawn and then you put him in the stocking what's hanging at the foot of joey's bed along with your own gifts afore you call him then first thing he sees when he rises up to grab his toys will be the little dog atop of all the rest which many promised to do and did do and joey toddled over the minute after he'd swallowed his breakfast to tell mr pegram how santa claus had sent him the wonderfulest little dinky dog ever was seen i'm the santa claus that sent it my lovely cherub said teddy kissing his beautiful face and santa claus he was to joey from that day forward it pleased the man well to be so called and he got the nickname in joseph ford's house and became santa claus to all of em there's much in a name said teddy and more in that one than you may guess for i was made of a ship so called once on a time and had some of my best voyages in her the friendship tightened after that christmas and it weren't till many a long month later and the fall of another year that anything happened to strain it they had all got to be so friendly as you please and then in the barley sheaf one day joseph ford heard ned Chown laughing with a customer or two and afore they knew it he picked up a word he didn't let em guess he'd heard however but ordered his beer and spoke of something else which they was very willing to do for joseph happened to be a mighty smart officer and secret subjects sometimes got mentioned that weren't meant for his ear it happened that poaching was in the air a good bit just then for the big oak shot covers ran half a mile from little silver and there had been a lot more trouble than usual that winter and the old headkeeper dismissed and a younger and sterner man engaged from up north but the robbery went on and there's no doubt a lot of pheasants slipped away to an unknown market joseph ford was so keen as the gamekeepers to lay the rogues by the heels for the police had heard a few hard words from the lord of the manor on the subject 
but the general opinion ran that some clever rascals from far ways off in the south hams were responsible while the new keeper from yorkshire who had a large experience of poacher's tricks said most steadfast that in his judgment it was local men with the advantages of being on the spot they raked the poulterers and three market towns round about but all gave a very good and straight account of their birds and the mystery interested us a lot for of course little silver had its doubtful customers like every other place and what joseph ford had heard with a smothered laugh or two was the name of his fast friend teddy pegram along with the disappearance of the oakshot game he gave no sign but it hit him with a good bit of force because he'd marked one or two things himself that made him restless and he knew teddy didn't pretend any great sorrow to think the pheasants were being stole the man loved sport and farmers round about let him shoot their rabbits and partridges also but he knew very well pheasants were different though he always argued against all game laws so joseph counted to give teddy a word in season on the quiet and he done so i heard your name whispered in the public-house a few nights agone he said and i didn't like it too well pegram because they named it along with this here poachin they little thought i'd heard of course and i didn't undeceive em but there's this and i'd avoid the appearance of evil if i was you and bide in on moony nights which we know very well you do not the other showed much surprise to hear such a thing he was playing along with joey and the little dog at the time and teaching the puppy to learn tricks the creature was full of brains as mongrels are apt to be and joey loved it dearly and loved the giver only less he'd called it chalk because the puppy loved chocolate so well as joey himself and the dog had grown to be his dearest treasure well teddy gave over his games now and stood up and showed a great deal of annoyance his bead-black eyes flashed and his jaw stood out as it always did when he was vexed too bad he said if i knew who the man was i'd have him up for libel i reckon i may or may not agree about the damn birds but i wouldn't have made a policeman my fast friend in this place if i weren't a straight man and i'm a good bit surprised joseph that you thought it worth your while to name such a thing to me and i'll go out of a moony night when and where i please so long as it's a free country so now then he sulked a bit and didn't come to see the fords for a week though joey was over often enough to see him and joseph felt rather interested to mark how the little man had taken it but then santa claus made friends again and came into sunday supper and brought a pheasant along with him he made a lot of fun about it and pretended as he'd shot it in the cupboards overnight and presently he told joseph that if he wanted to run him in he'd best to go to mercer's at newton abbott first and find out if he'd bought it all decent and in order or if he had not so the matter dropped and all was firm friends again till the blow fell poaching went on and joseph noted that teddy was apt to be from home a bit and would often go away for a day or two and the new headkeeper who was sleepless on the job traced where a car had come across one of the drives in oak shots by night for the wheels had scored the grass and where the thing had stood was a dead bird the blackguards had overlooked the pheasant had been shot roosting and an air gun was the weapon for they found the slug in it and the next thing was that just before the end of the season joseph ford set out to lend a hand with the job on his own unknown to anybody but the head keeper he worked out of his business hours and off the regular policeman's beats and the keeper who now felt pretty sure one of his own undermen was in it and he'd got treachery to deal with put joseph up to a secret plan oak shots is a huge place and the six keepers kept there couldn't be everywhere but an unknown seventh man might steal a march on the rogues and lie hid when twas given out the others were somewhere else and that was done by joseph with a very startling result the season had near reached an end when on a quiet moonlit night in january joseph kept his third secret watch at the edge of the north wood he'd got there at dusk being off duty at the time and there he bided and then just after moonrise he saw a dog slip past him within ten yards and he knew the dog very well and his heart sank 
behind the lurcher came her master and teddy with something in his hand that glinted popped by silent as a ghost and was gone into the covers but joseph knew he'd be bound to come out on the high road same way he went in so he bided there and an hour passed and then twenty minutes more and meantime the policeman heard the purr of a motor and saw a small car without lights draw up on the dark side of the lane twenty yards off there was only one man in it and joseph felt glad there weren't more he chanced pegram then for a minute then and nipped out on the driver just as he was lighting a cigarette he proved to be a young fellow from so far off as torquay and he didn't put up no fight whatever feeling no fear on his own account he was working for wages and doing what he was told and he caved in at once and obeyed the policeman's orders that worse might not overtake him so he sat tight and waited and then teddy pegram and his dog and his air gun crept out of the woods with a load of ten birds they roosted in the spruce firs you understand and twas as easy to slay them as black beetles for teddy's eyes helped by the moon marked em above his head quick enough then joseph ford walked out from behind the car and the little man saw his games were ended for ford was a very powerful chap and could have eaten him if he'd wanted to do so but teddy used his tongue for all it was worth though at first he didn't guess he was up against it i lucky twas you he said if i'd been your maid i'd have met with a difficulty very smart joseph you've bowled me out all right so we'll cry quits and least said soonest mended but the policeman wasn't in no mood like that come pegram he answered i'd sooner have took any man on earth but you and you've put me in a cruel fix and that's all there is to it give me that there air gun and get in the car and say not if you please t'other had a lot to say however they talked for ten minutes but the poacher couldn't move the policeman though he appealed to his friendship and so on then joseph saw a look that he never had seen before in the little man's eyes and was startled but not afeard for a minute teddy glared like a devil in the moonlight and an awful evil expression fairly flooded his face think twice he said for god's sake think twice ford afore you do this there's a lot more to me than you know a lot i've thought to overcome suffering misery curses disgrace but if you take me to the cooler to-night hear me on my oath you'll be sorry as long as you live for i'm built that way i am sorry already answered joseph i'm as sorry as any living man can be and tis a bitter cruel thing for me that you force this upon me i warned you most serious i'd done so and what more could i do you've none to thank for this but yourself and you well know it but my duty's my duty and i don't break my policeman's oath for you or any man living you ain't on duty to-night however replied teddy a policeman's always on duty said ford and tis vain to threat or argue i've got no choice but the other did argue still and when he saw he was done he threatened also and said hard terrible words they went in one of joseph's ears and out of the other of course and he only wanted to get a painful job out of hand by now so he cut it short and in another minute pretty well lifted teddy into the car and bade the driver carry him to little silver pegram said no more after that but a fiend glared out of his eyes as he stared on the other and joseph though he'd seen some hard cases said afterwards that he never wanted to look on such a wicked face again but the look was dead when they got to the police station and ford tumbled his man into a cell then handed the pheasants over to the inspector and made his report there was a good deal of stir about it and some applause for the policeman when the justices gave teddy two months hard labor and that was that but what you may call the interesting part of the affair happened after for when the two months was up instead of selling his house and taking himself off to practice his games elsewhere if teddy pegram didn't return to little silver meek as moses and a reformed character poor joy when he heard his dearest friend was in trouble had wept a lot of tears and took on very bad and even said hard things to his father for catching santa claus and sending him to prison but he got resigned to his loss for two months is a long time in a child's mind and he'd walk every day to look at pegram's house and pet the poacher's dog 
twas thought the creature ought to be shot and the headkeeper at oakshots who knew the cleverness of the animal was strong for it but humanity be full of strange twists and the squire himself it was who ordered the cur should live and be tended let the dog be there to welcome him back said the squire in his easy way the dog's done nothing but his duty and done it mighty well by all accounts he was pleased you see because he'd got to the bottom of the mystery and he had a great trustful faith in human nature and hoped that teddy would turn from his bad ways after a taste of clink and it certainly looked as if the good man was right little joey would often take chalk to see his mother on her chain at teddy's house while the man was put away and he'd carry the poor creature a tidy bone also when he could get one and how long that two months was to the lurcher who shall say but one fine morning pegram was back again and he welcomed the child same as he'd already welcomed his dog and joey went back full of great joy to say as his friend was home once more and terrible pleased to see him which interested joseph and many ford a good bit for they guessed that they'd made a bitter and dangerous enemy in that quarter and little thought to see the man again yet he'd come back and more wonderful still afore he'd been home a week he made bold to step in one night and shake their hands and say twas a very nice thing to be home in his own den a free man they felt mazed to see him among them so cheerful and full of talk as if he'd been away for a holiday and joseph wondered a lot and felt it on the tip of his tongue to name the past and express friendly hopes for the future but he didn't and it weren't till he saw santa claus down to the gate on his way home that the little chap spoke say not and try to forget he said you done your duty and that's all the best and worst of us can do be my friend for i've got but few then he was gone and joseph woke to a surer trust in humanity and felt our common nature crying to him to believe it while his own policeman's nature warned him to do no such thing he talked far into the night with his wife but she was all for believing us be christians said many and well we know how the lord works he's come to right thinking by chastisement and his heart softened and never will i believe a man as loves the little ones like him be so very bad he's paid for what he done and if he wants to forget and forgive tis everybody's place to do the same that sounds all right granted joseph and who be i to say he's not a repentant man but you didn't see his face with ten devils staring out of his eyes when i took him us'll watch and pray for him answered many my heart tells me the poor man won't fall again and they left it at that and many prayed and joseph watched and the woman triumphed over her husband a good bit as time went on for teddy pegram never looked back so far as could be seen until little by little even joseph felt that his spell in the jug had changed teddy to a member of society a good bit out of the common his friends reckoned that when another autumn came the strain would be too much and the old poacher might be found to fall but as ted chowne pointed out it weren't very likely as pegram would fall again in the same place if he was minded to fall he'd sling his hook and go and fall somewhere else where he weren't known he said and indeed teddy had made the same remark himself he stuck to lawful sport and went his quiet way until that happened which looked as though he might soon be minded to flit in the fall he sold his cottage to ned chowne who owned a few little dwellings already and was a great believer in the virtue of house property but pegram only let the innkeeper have it on one condition and that was that he should be allowed to go on living in it while he chose to do so he explained to joseph ford that he never meant to leave little silver but that he was very poor and a thought pressed for money and glad to have the value of the house in his pocket again so another year passed over em all and the end of the strange business of santa claus came on another christmas eve when he dropped in to see the fords and express his friendship and good wishes they quite slipped back into the old kindly understanding and joseph felt long since convinced that his stern dealing had been the salvation of the man a fact teddy himself often declared without shame they cared for him a lot by now and many never tired of singing his praises and the child never felt a day well spent if his friend didn't come into it 
joey was in bed and asleep before pegram called in his character of santa claus but he'd not forgot his gift and produced a fine box of sweets to be put on top of the child's stocking along with a christmas card he looked in on sleeping joey also and smiled to see the child in the land of dreams with his dog asleep beside him and then he gave minnie a gift also a piece of very fine cloth to make herself a gown and he promised to come and eat his christmas dinner along with them which joseph insisted he should do ford was on night duty at the time and he left the house with the old poacher and saw him to his own home while good words passed between them then young ford went to his beat and wondered as he walked at such a fine reformation and felt proud of himself to think he'd had a hand in it yet though seldom it came uppermost in his thoughts by some chance the ancient awful look on teddy's face rose to his mind that christmas eve joseph had a theory sure founded on scripture and he stoutly believed that the poacher had harbored a devil in him in the past yet now without a doubt it has been cast out thought joseph and no man will ever see it look out of his eyes no more because it have gone thank god his duty done he went home to rest but the man's sleep was broken just after peep a day by the awfulest scream ever he heard his child it was joey slept in a little room alongside his parents and of course minnie was up to him like a flash of lightning with joseph after her he said at a later time that santa claus had got in his dreams and he had suffered all night from a great uneasiness but he was sleeping sound enough when just after six o'clock the child screamed and screamed again and still he screamed when his mother got to him and his father followed after stopping only to light a candle poor joey was out of bed with his mother's arms around him when his father got there and on the bed lay teddy's box of sweets scattered over the cover lid with the christmas stockings dragged up also but its contents not yet explored the sweeties came first and joey had opened them and now he screamed and pointed and screamed again but for the moment couldn't speak he pointed into one corner of his little cubbyhole and then the tears came flooding his cheeks and he stopped screaming and clung to his mother and wept as if his heart would break ford policeman-like saw it all instanter and a curtain seemed to lift off his soul and there glared the eyes of santa claus into his mind's eye in a second he put two and two together and understood why deep in his brain that night had hidden such a feeling of stark care have you touched they sweets he asked shaking the little boy to make him attend speak for your life joey have you ate one still the child couldn't collect himself he screamed again when his father shook him and it was clear some fearful thing had overtook him but his grief didn't rise from no pain of body and in truth the answer to joseph's questions lay before his eyes if he'd but understood the truth no scream would joey have screamed nor a tear shed if he'd helped himself from the box but twas a case when a big heart saved a little body for joey had put another creature before himself and the first sweetie out of the gift had went to his pup twas chocolate santa claus had left and when the dog's jaws closed upon his little master's gift he gave one jump and leapt off the bed and was stone dead in three seconds before the child got to him all that the parents presently learned from the shaking babe and the moment joseph grasped the truth he left his wife to praise god and got on his clothes and ran without ceasing to teddy pegram's house and in no christmas temper did he run neither for he'd well have liked in his fury to rob the hangman of a job the size of the intended crime swept over him in all its horror as he measured the past and remembered all that the poacher had said and done and his feet very near gave under him to think of what a fellow-creature can harbor hid from every other human eye but he wasn't over much surprised to find teddy pegram didn't answer the door nor yet to discover the place was all unlocked he doubted not that his awful enemy had departed overnight and it came out presently that the last at little silver to see pegram was ford himself on the previous evening so he left it at that then and went home and joined his wife in blessing the maker for his mercy and calming the sorrows and terrors of their little lad 
an unrestful christmas for the local police and the countryside was soon busy over teddy pegram while next day the box of chocolates received attention and was found so full of venom as the poisoner could pack em a nine days wonder and no more for though the police was so placed they could soon learn a lot they didn't know about the would-be murderer the wretch himself escaped em that time but a very interesting thing threw light and when teddy's cottage came to be hunted over though not a stick offered to show who he might be or where he might have sped some fingerprints was took by the police and they got a good picture off an empty bottle in a cupboard and another off a frying pan and so it got to be understood that santa claus was a famous criminal who had come to little silver straight from seven years of penal servitude for manslaughter and had a record so long as from nougat to princeton and he was sixty-three years old or so they thought they traced him back to london and lost him there but five years afterwards hiram linkletter for that was his famous name swung in earnest for murder of a woman in the peak of derbyshire always for rural districts he was and a great one for the wonders of nature he told the chaplain of his adventures at little silver and expressed penitence afore he dropped he also said that nothing in his whole career had given him more pleasure than to hear how his christmas eve effort down at devonshire had miscarried after all and he pointed out how by the will of god his own gift to the little boy had saved him and he was said to have made a brave end which no doubt ain't as difficult as people imagine tis the like of hiram linkladder i reckon as keep up the sentiment of approval for capital punishment because even in the softest head it must be granted that a baby poisoner is the sort that's better under the earth than on it end of santa claus by eden philpotts